Good evening, everybody. This is Darius Asemi with GVWR. Welcome to Unfiltered. Good evening, Mike. Good evening, Darius. Good to see you. Good, good to see Happy you. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Uh, we have a great show uh, for you this evening. Uh, we have two outstanding physicians joining us, uh, Dr. Chris Perkins, oncologist, and Dr. Sorab, uh, Sorabi, ear, nose, and throat specialist. I can't quite pronounce, and, and Dr. Sorabi can probably tell us how to pronounce the ear, nose, and throat specialty. Um, but we get to, we, we'll get to Chris and, uh, yeah, we'll get to Chris and uh, Sorab here shortly. But before we do, let's talk about what's been going on the last few days. Uh, Mike, uh, did you know that uh, Governor DeSantis was here? I did. Okay. I read about that on GV Wire. Okay. So... Uh, <clears throat> so let's put that slide up, slide six, and uh, all the stuff that uh, the governor talked about uh, in calling uh, at an event. Uh, if you can put six up. You know what uh, California did recently. Now we yeah. moved back our, our a few years ago presidential primary to March. So, you know, we're an earlier state. That makes you more in place. So they're going to come to California. And, and Even he, Republicans will come to California. And he said, actually, California is relevant in this election. Mm. I don't exactly know what that means. Well, uh, they, anyways, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna stop. Okay, I almost said something. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, he talks about China. China is stronger than ever, and that you need to have uh, relations with all countries across the globe. Uh, so, uh, and don't worry about who does uh, business with Russia or not. But we just need to have strong uh, relations with all trade partners. He also talked about Trump's tariffs that they're not effective. He went after Trump. And also on fentanyl, how Biden is not doing anything on fentanyl and neither did Trump. Well, I don't think that's true. The tariffs are very effective at hurting our economy. <laughs> okay, there you go. Okay. Uh, and also how fast he took care of uh, three broken uh, access points or causeways to after the hurricanes a few months ago. Uh, in a matter of days, uh, the causeways were back open. Uh, Versus, um, typically, oops, sorry about that. Typically, uh, you know, in California, that would have taken um, months, basically. Okay, we have two Chris Perkins on, which we don't need. We need, there we go, now, uh, a couple more technical glitches. Let's see. Can we put any of us on? There you go. Chris, you're not double. It's only one of you, but we'll get Sir Rob on, hopefully, here shortly. But before we even get to Chris... Uh, we did a couple of polls. Let's put the slide three up. Should California Governor Gavin Newsom run for president? Uh, majority, overwhelming majority of folks, uh, GB Wire Facebook uh, viewers said no. A um, couple of other co comments to, to, to make. Uh, Saturday, this Saturday marks the one-year anniversary of Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe versus Wade holding that there is no longer a federal constitution, constitutional right to abortion and that states have their own decisions to make. Um, and then uh, we had a poll on that. Let's put slide five up. Uh, do you support the decision of the Supreme Court to overturn? And again, majority of folks, at least in the GVYR Facebook uh, poll, said uh, yes, we do support. Basically, overturning the federal uh, the federal protection and making it a, a, a state issue. Uh, one more item before we jump into our top our uh, guest speakers and our panelists. Um, uh, we had lot, lots of graduations last uh, couple of weeks. Yep. Uh, you graduated from a long time ago from Bullard. I no no, no. I went okay. to Bullard for one year and then went to Clovis okay. West. So I'm a Clovis Unified grad. Okay, yeah, cool. Let's put <clears throat> slide seven up. There you go. Over nine thousand folks, folks, young uh, men and women, young uh, students, right, uh, graduated from our four main schools: Fresno Unified. Almost 4,000. Clovis Unified, 3,400. Central at 1,000 at almost. And Sanger Unified at, at almost 1,000. So uh, a lot of folks. You know what's interesting about those numbers, if we can yeah. get that slide back up? It's really interesting. Uh, I think Clovis Unified, even though they're, I think, 
considerably smaller than, than Fresno Unified. They've graduated almost as many students. Look how, at that. How big is Clovis? Uh, Fresno Unified. Fresno's third, so it was 77? Fresno Unified is 72 or 74,000. Okay. And Clovis Unified is... What do we have there? 43, almost 43,000. Right. So, and they have, I think I read their, their graduation rate, they claim is 97% or more. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, what's going on? How many kids aren't graduating uh, from Fresno Unified that are, that are considered part of the student population, unless they yeah. have a lot of freshmen and not uh, seniors? That's, that's interesting. Hmm. That, was, that was very, uh, those in, interesting stats, but really the fact that we have over 9,000 new high school grads that are ready to enter the workforce or go to college or take on any, any of the great responsibilities. And this is why trade programs in primary education yeah. is so important because yeah. some of them, you know, they're going to go right now and start working and we need that in our community. Yeah. yeah the skilled workforce. I agree. Very cool. Okay. Uh, anything else? Let's see. Uh, you want to discuss? Uh, we did this, Paul. Okay. 60%. No. We did both of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, was, did, that one doesn't we, me. we covered both polls. Okay. Uh, uh, Governor, Gov Gavin Newsom, Governor Newsom, should, should he run for president? Uh, overwhelming majority was no, he shouldn't. Well, look, we've got, a, with all due respect, a major deficit. We have problems here. Um, I think people want that figured out. We've got issues with homelessness all over the place. Now, he's tried. Legislator right. Legislature push, pushed back on him. But uh, we've got uh, our major deficit issues. People are leaving. Businesses are leaving California. And uh, our tax base is going to suffer tremendously. <laughs> and a lot of those folks are going to Florida. Uh, Ron Texas, DeSantis Florida, has talked about yeah. that. They're, yeah. they're moving to Florida. Edu oh, by the way, he talked about education also, that um, Florida, uh, California is one of the last in the state, on the bottom mm -hmm. in terms of education, and Florida rising quickly, and he's going to duplicate that program uh, if he becomes president. Did you talk about why he hates Disney, like the biggest single tax performer in Florida? Honestly, you're going, to, you're going to attack them. Like, let the market decide. If, if the consumers are angry at Disney for their policies, let the consumers decide. The governor is going out With their there. Pocketbook. It doesn't matter if it's Gavin Newsom or, or Ron DeSantis. You're going out there and you're attacking your biggest source of revenue, whether it's like Tesla in California or it's going to be yeah. uh, Disney. I mean, is he Republican or Democrat? I'm confused. <laughs> Uh, I'm confused. Because usually you're pro-business if, if you're a Republican. Those are great, great comments, Mike. Right. Let's Just put char uh, slide six back up for one minute um, for more information on what Governor DeSantis of Florida talked about when he was in Central California yesterday. Go to gbwire.com. There's two, artic two different articles uh, that, you can, that you can get more information in detail on uh, what he talked about. Okay, with that... Are we ready to bring Dr. Chris Perkins on the screen? Um, there he is. Dr. Perkins, good evening to you. But these days, you can order any... <laughs> you know, uh, like, I think they're having a little uh, side conversation so, about... Uh, okay. Uh, Which Uber is, again, something, something you, you did to yourself. Uh, yeah. Doctors. Okay, hold on. Gotcha. Uh, we can hear Sorab, but uh, we should... Can we, is there a way to mute Sorab uh, or bring him on as well? But we want to be. He's mute. Okay, great. So, Dr. Perkins, uh, cancer, how to prevent it, how to kill cancer. You've talked, uh, I've talked to you on many occasions about um, how cancer is a giant industry in, in our country and really in, in most of the, throughout the world, especially the, uh, the uh, advanced uh, first, first world uh, countries. Lots of money in, in cancer care, chemotherapy, et cetera. Uh, I understand most uh, oncologists have a five to ten million dollars a month in the chemotherapy just for the just for the uh, uh, the drug itself, uh, Bill. But you've talked, uh, you and I have talked, and you've talked many times about how to prevent cancer um, and how to actually go after and kill cancer and it's not always about, well, we know we shouldn't smoke or we shouldn't be in the sun too much or we shouldn't drink too much. But uh, I want to turn it, turn it over to you. Uh, tell us your thoughts um, and the audience, your thoughts on cancer, chemotherapy, how to prevent, and then how to really go after and kill cancer. Well, I think, you know, this start, we should start with what, what is cancer? I mean, so many people say, oh, my, my relative has lung cancer colon cancer, well, what, what is cancer? Um, 
cancer, you know, cells in the body undergo active division all the time. You cut yourself and the wound heals and you don't have a scar, hopefully for the most part. What cancer is, is that it is it, something inside the cell and there are many mechanisms within the cell, the DNA or RNA that goes a little sideways. And instead of dividing and stopping, the cell loses what we refer to as contact inhibition. That is, as a cell grows, it comes into contact with another cell and it says, oh, I'm in contact with another cell, I better stop growing. Well, in cancer, it continues to grow and grow and grow. And when we talk about cancer, we talk about a primary cancer, and then we talk about metastasis or when that cancer has spread somewhere else. We know that cancer is a second leading cause of death in the United States. So a huge number of people develop cancer. We kind of, you know, are understanding every month better and better the causes of cancer. Before we used to think, well, it was just an irritant, you know, like tobacco smoke, it irritated the lung airways. And so because of that chronic irritation, and we know that chronic inflammation is one of the causes of cancer, that you know, a person developed lung cancer. This, this idea was in the 50s and 60s. And then what evolved is that we started looking at gene mutations within the cancer cell itself and found that, wow, it's just not a chronic irritation. It's a chronic irritation that leads to some aberrant gene proliferation within the cancer cell. Now, when we think of genes, we think mainly of DNA, but there also are breaks within the RNA and transport communication pathways within the cancer cell that also are disturbed by outside forces. And obviously, you know, I, when I was a practicing oncologist, I would get asked all the time, why did I develop breast cancer? Well, you know, for the most part, breast cancer, we have some idea of the causes, but you have, you know, the 60-year-old who runs 15 miles a week and has had a healthy diet and then develops breast cancer. So some of cancer is just bad luck. You know, we talk about in breast cancer, people will talk about the BRCA gene or genes that cause breast cancer, but really those gene, the genes that we know of right now are only comprised of 6% of all breast cancer. So it's not a huge thing because majority of people don't have a genetic predisposition, at least in breast cancer. So we know the large factors now, you know, are lifestyle. You know, we talk about tobacco, uh, that's an obvious one in lung cancer, but it's, you know, there are people who develop lung cancer that have never smoked. We talk about obesity, which we'll, I will touch on in greater detail as we get into the cures of cancer. We talk, of, you know, we also know that lack, lack of exercise um, and processed foods. And, you know, here in America, um, you know, processed foods is uh, quite prevalent. And you notice that when you go to Europe and you go to a restaurant and it has so much better flavor than restaurants here in the United States because they're there. It's against the law to sell processed foods. So, you know, in a nutshell, cancer is a proliferation of normal cells that become abnormal because of some gene break or some internal mechanism within the cancer cell. Now, how do we treat this? Well, I think before we jump into treatment, we need to talk briefly about diagnosis because it's one of my pet peeves, especially in breast cancer, because you know women will present with a lump you know, say in their 30s, they see the gynecologist, they are told they're too young for breast cancer. And before you know it, you know, that lump is now a mass and it is cancer. So, you know, we have multiple ways of detecting cancer. You know, screening mammograms are important. Screening colonoscopies are important. Um, but there's not a lot of prevent, there's not a lot of screening tools. Uh, our research organization is looking at blood samples to see if there's a way that we could draw blood on a regular basis in the general population and pick up cancers earlier than, say, a chest x-ray or a mammogram or a colonoscopy. You know, is that prime time? There is some company or one company in particular that thinks it's prime time, but it's really not 
prime time yet, or else we still wouldn't be under investigation. This idea would still not be under investigation. So as far as treatment, we have, you know, usually the first approach is surgery, you know, cut it out. Um, surgery is interesting. It's taken an evolutionary process, especially in some cancers where we're treating patients with chemotherapy before surgery and sometimes um, downs, what we refer to as downstaging the tumor, making the tumor smaller so it makes the surgeon's job easier to go in and cut the cancer out. We talk about chemotherapy. Well, chemotherapy is, I mean, that's a huge definition these days because chemotherapy in the old days were what we refer to as cytotoxic drugs. Cyto meaning the cell and toxic meaning toxic to the cell. How does chemotherapy work? Well, cancer cells divide fat, usually divide faster than regular cells. So their DNA is constantly dividing. So you throw in chemotherapy at a cancer cell, and because of that active division, you kill off more cancer cells because they're dividing faster than regular cells. For example, people that lose their hair during chemotherapy, the hair is an active, uh, you know, your hair grows quickly. So it's, again, it, it's one of those fast dividing uh, cells that grow and is sensitive to chemotherapy. But chemotherapy also includes a lot of other things, you know, immunotherapy. We have drugs now that, so the cancer is smart. If it wasn't so smart, you know, smart guys like us would have cured it by now, but we haven't because cancer cells have the ability to evade the immune system. And they do that by developing what we've referred to as a cloak, well, I refer to it, to make it easier to understand, a cloak around it. So the immune system bypasses the cancer and doesn't pick it up. So now we, come, we have um, a drug, a group of drugs called PDL1 inhibitors that pull that cloak away and expose the cancer cell to the immune system. So we're able to fight uh, <clears throat> the cancer by using your own immune system. We've looked at vaccines, we looked at interferon, a lot of ways of stimulating the immune system to fight the cancer. It's an area that's just being touched upon because the immune system is so complicated and so is cancer. You have a list there of a lot of different chemotherapeutic agents, um, but even more importantly than what you're putting there, because those are old types of chemotherapy, is that we have targeted therapy now. That is, you know, I talked earlier about a particular gene that goes sideways in a cancer cell, but we have oral as well as IV treatment that goes after that particular gene. So it's not just poisoning the whole body. It's not just poisoning that particular, that, you know, the good cells and the bad cells, but it's a, a drug that's tailored just to that gene. A perfect case in point is HER2 in breast cancer. HER2 is present in about 20% of all breast cancers and it is a target now. We have multiple agents that shut that gene off and by shutting that gene off makes the cancer cell exquisitely sensitive to chemotherapy. And because of the manipulation of this gene, we're able to cure more patients. This, um, this drug, Herceptin, was discovered by Denny Slayman at UCLA and here in Fresno, believe it or not, we, in those trials, it was an international trial using Herceptin in both metastatic and upfront treatment. We were the third largest accruer in the world in Fresno. So, you know, Fresno has always had a foot in clinical trial work. So let's talk. Yeah, I was going to say, you want to talk about some of the non-traditional uh, solutions to cancer that uh, you've shared uh, with, uh, with me before and with, with several folks? Sure. So, you know, the way we make advances in cancer care through clinical trials, we can compare X drug to Y drug. We realize that after five or 10 years of follow-up, Y drug is better than X drug. And this is called a scientific method. Socrates, the philosopher, was the one that did that form the scientific method. And this is the basis of how we discover and how we make advances in cancer care. So 
the reason why I'm bringing this up is, is because, you know, as an oncologist or physicians, we get bombarded daily. Well, how about this? You know, how about coffee enemas? How about Laetrile? How about, you know, there's a litany of stuff out on the market because quackery in medicine is a multi-billion dollar business. And if somebody can sell something, they will. For example, Laetril, which was famous in the 1960s, the apricot pit uh, Laetril, um, was a billion dollar business. And the gentleman that promoted it had a huge <laughs> house in Acapulco and it never turned out to be anything. So, what about, uh, Chris, what about fasting? Uh, and let's, okay, let's go get into that subject because that's a huge subject. So obesity contributes, obesity in America, um, overweight and obesity comprises about 70% of the population in the United States. 42% of patients are obese, obese in the United States and 30% are overweight. We know that obesity and being overweight contributes to 42% increased risk of developing cancer. Um, wow. And why is that? You know, what are, you know, we're going to get into intermittent fasting in just a minute. So why does obesity cause cancer? Obesity, we don't really understand it entirely. We used to think of it as insulin levels because in obese patients they have higher insulin levels and insulin levels might feed the cancer. The quote, I, the question I get a lot in my practice was, oh, you know, sugar causes cancer. Well, that's not true. You know, cancers are way smarter than just that. So there are other growth factors, so cytokines. There's a lot of growth factors that they're trying to understand why there is such a huge increase in all cancers, but mainly breast, uterine, prostate, and colorectal in patients who are obese. Um, and so the key to prevent... And, so in America, we spend seven trillion dollars a year in healthcare. Seven trillion with a T. Wow. Thirty percent, thirty percent. So two point one trillion dollars is spent be, uh, because of obesity, obesity-induced healthcare dollars. And this is not all just cancer. It's diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. But you know, obesity is just the killer. So if you came to me and said, hey, you know, what's the cure for cancer? I would say immediately, I have a drug that can cure 30% of all cancers and prevent cancers in 30 and 42% of the population. That drug is called dieting. That drug is called caloric restriction. And I'll give you a perfect example in my practice. So a woman comes in with breast cancer. She has, you know, a type of cancer that if you treat with chemotherapy, you can reduce the risk of reoccurrence. In some of those cases, the risk reduction is not that great. It might be six to ten percent. So a patient will lose her hair, feel crummy, for a six to ten percent reduction in risk of reoccurrence. So there is a trial called the Women's Health Initiative trial that looked at reducing risk of breast cancer reoccurrence in women who have had breast cancer. If a woman were to you take a low fat diet, meaning less than 20% of the calories in fat, exercise at least three hours a week, which is not a lot, and no more than three drinks per week, she can, that patient can reduce her risk of reoccurrence by 28%. Wow. So I give chemotherapy, make them feel crummy, uh, lose their hair for a six to 10% reduction. But then when you talk to them about modification in their own personal lifestyle, they don't want to adhere to that. So I think, you know, the, 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 the problem in America that we have is that, number one, you know, we talk about food scarcity in some populations, but also the, the ability to have food and supersize it at McDonald's, whatever fast food place, that's the cure. You know, if you wanted to save $2.1 trillion a year, you would motivate society to watch what they put in their mouth. You know, I was at one of the great, you know, I have to digress here a minute. 
you know, I practiced in Fresno for 40 years and recently moved out of Fresno. And I come back in Fresno intermittently because I have a research company. And I'll tell you, Fresno is an amazing city, absolutely amazing city. So the reason why I bring that up is because I went to the zoo with my granddaughter a few weeks ago and was blown away by the Fresno Zoo. It was spectacular zoo. That's good to also, hear. You, we have a new exhibit uh, on kingdoms of Asia. So if you come back, you're going to see a whole new section of the zoo again. So come on back. It's, um, you know, I'll tell you, Fresno is an amazing city. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not going to mention the city that I'm living in, but I'll tell you, if, if Fresno is close to a beach, I would stay in Fresno. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, beautiful city. It's clean. It's nice. But anyway, my plug of Fresno. But when I went to the zoo, I was just appalled by the number of people who are obese. Mm. I mean, to the point of requiring wheelchairs to get around. But the part that ached me was not so much, you know, the adults with obesity. But we know that being obese as a child, check this data out, as a child quadruples your risk of developing uterine cancer as an adult, quadruples wow. as a child. And so, you know, I'm a very much of a child advocate. You know, I'm involved in child's program, children's programs in this country and out of the country. And I ache to see what these parents are teaching their children. You know, I really, you know, I obviously do care about my fellow man, but I care about children way more than adults. And it's just too bad that we're leaving that legacy to our children. It's like, okay, you know, eat whatever you want. It's so, allowing so, the so kids Chris, almost to develop so, somewhat of a, a suicidal so idea Chris, what, of not taking good care of themselves. Chris, so let's talk about the, the fasting benefits of uh, fasting and uh, you know, besides, you know, lowering weight and getting out of obesity, uh, what are the benefits of fasting? And should, is it, should it be in, intermittent fasting or 48-hour fast or longer term? Kind of Knowing that, by the way, all religions, uh, all, all the major religions have some kind of a re recommendation for fasting. Uh, Muslims do Ramadan for 30 days, roughly. Uh, Christians do Lent over a 40-day period. They give up at least one item. Uh, and uh, Jews do a 48-hour uh, fast. Um, Yom Kippur, yeah. Yom Kippur, Passover. <clears throat> so uh, tell us about fasting, because then, then we're going to get to Dr. Sarabi and his thoughts. Uh, he had a recommendation on this show a few months ago on five things to do to boost your immune system. So uh, can it walk us through uh, fasting, benefits of fasting, and anything else on nutrition? Well, the, the data, most of the data is in animals on fasting. Uh, but the first published article on fasting and, and cancer was published in 1909 that they injected rats with cancer and fasted them and found that the group of patient, the uh, rats that were fasted had tumor regression, not slowed the growth, but tumor regression. And we know that fasting during chemotherapy, there's some data to suggest that might improve responses, but more importantly, it lessens the chances of a low white count. So there's definite um, advantages of fasting during chemotherapy. There are also is some animal data to suggest that fasting, and we'll talk about intermittent and the types of fasting, can increase longevity by 64% in one rat model. There was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at human fasting. This was about 15 years ago. And that by reducing your total body weight by 10% can add 4.6 years to your life. Wow. So, you know, there's a lot of different fasting. There's chronic um, caloric restriction. That is where you just cut back on calories throughout the day. There is intermittent fasting where you, um, you know, might fast for a day or a week. And then there's the, you know, keto fast, which is a high fat, low carbohydrate, low protein fast. And I think all of these have good evidence to suggest that they're beneficial because a lot of these fastings, what happens is that, as I mentioned before, 
is that there's chronic um, stimulation and chronic irritation by multiple food categories. Uh, one, for example, is celiac. You know, when patients are have celiac disease, that's an autoimmune disease. And so, but we all have mild autoimmune responses to what we put in our mouth. And if you're able to curtail that, so you cut back on the chronic inflammatory state that causes cancer. Um, Can I ask you a question, Dr. Perkins? So yeah. let's say, I know it depends on the kind of cancer. Let's say, I've never had cancer before, thank goodness. But let's say I go to a doctor, I'm diagnosed with pancreatic or bronchial or colon cancer. What is the conventional, what will most doctors say is the, the start? What do I do, man or woman? I mean, and then what are some of the alternatives you're suggesting that maybe uh, you know, other doctors may prescribe? Yeah, so let's talk about number one, the first question, because he asked two questions there. Uh, the most important aspect of doctor-patient interaction is the doctor-patient relationship. It has to be um, transparent. It has to be with passion. You know, most of us got into medicine not because we wanted to have an MD at the end of our name, but because we wanted to do good work. We wanted to take care of people. And so, you know, it's really important that that interaction is solid and good and that the patient and the doctor have open lines of communication. If they don't, that patient needs to get a second opinion. Um, because, uh, you know, it's very important that interaction because hopefully that interaction will go on for years. Can so, I, can I, uh, uh, Chris, can I <clears throat> jump back in? You were talking about, I think, I think uh, Mike's question is about, you know, uh, what, what are the not, we, we know everybody basically prescribes chemotherapy, but the non-conventional <clears throat> recommendations that you had and you were on. You were talking about intermittent fasting and ketogenic fasting. Uh, anything else should should the patient be looking at doing immediately? Not only after you've you know been diagnosed, but also before. Is that I think yep. before Correct. you were diagnosed? Uh, so you you talked about you know obesity, weight loss, and, and fasting, uh, and and whether you know. As a matter of fact, let me just ask you this question. Should, should we all be looking at intermittent fasting every day? Or should we be Absolutely. looking at, uh, you, know, you know, prolonged 40? You talked about a 48-hour water fast. You, you talked about a seven, uh, I'm sorry, seven-day uh, water fast with just uh, green juice uh, to help prevent cancer. Uh, so that, you know, you, and then uh, prolonged fasting to actually where you're, your own mitochondria, your own cells, eat the cancer cells. Um, so, you know, can I maybe walk us through that, uh, some of those solutions? And then I, then I want to come back to uh, sulforaphane and some of these phytonutrients found in uh, like things like broccoli sprouts uh, that are substantially more, uh, have more nutrition and, and immune boosting uh, uh, capabilities than... Uh, so many of these drugs. So maybe let's start about the fasting, the, the intermittent fasting versus the 48-hour water fast versus the seven-day uh, and, and even further water and green juice uh, fast. Uh, tell us which ones are you know, preventative, uh, how to prevent cancer, and which ones, you know, if we think we have cancer, how, which, which one of those are most effective on um, you know, helping us cure cancer? Uh, this nasty disease. Well, D Darius, you are a man of discipline. And so to go to a patient or go to the general population and say, okay, we want you to start doing, you know, five, four or five day fasting, they're all going to tell you to go pound sand. I think what we need to do as a society is get into some mode where we are restricting calories on a chronic basis. You know, one thing that I noticed that I, when I went to the zoo, the busiest portion of the zoo was the food court. You know, they weren't yeah. standing watching the elephants. So, and then, so f fasting is beneficial no matter how you do it. I think if you wanted to be as strict as you possibly could, 
to do a 48 hour fast is beneficial, but you can't do a 48 hour fast and then go back to eating ho-hos and, and donuts. Um, you know, so it's that chronic manipulation of your diet that you're going to carry not just today or not for 48 hours, but for the rest of your life. Yep. And so I think by setting a, a, these high goals and high standards of, you know, you got to fast for 48 hours, it's not going to work. I think beneficially, you know, it'd be I, best I wanna, if I they, want our, if, our viewers to chime in because certain, I mean, look, there's free choice. Um, but then again, if you grow up in a household, they don't teach you those things. You don't realize calorie restriction, what that can do for you. Um, and you mentioned you add four and a half years to your life with every, how much, how much uh, weight would you lose? 10% of your body fat? Is that what you said? 10%. Right. Okay. So my, my question is, what do we do when governments say, we're going to, you can't buy larger size sodas, for example, or we're going to tax sugary drinks, for example, because a lot of people push back on that. So and I'm sure Dr. Sarabi has a lot of opinions on this. I think we talked about it before. Where is the line? And is that government's role or not? And I want to add, I want to, add to Mike's question. Uh, Suzanne uh, Crosina Sam has got a question. You know, you talked about, you know, government. Uh, Mike talks about uh, should government mandate uh, these big, big size drinks? Or restrict certain or, types of foods? Or restrict. Right. But let me just ask this, uh, this question. So is 48-hour fast, now you saw a lot of people eating food at the zoo, <laughs> but uh, uh, Suzanne asks, uh, is, are 48-hour fast beneficial if, you're, or if you already have cancer? And I have a question for you. 48-hour uh, water fast, how frequently should be doing that? So that's question one. Question two is, are 48-hour fast beneficial if you already have cancer, or do you need a much more prolonged uh, fasting uh, to be able to actually, you know, com combat uh, cancer. So that's, uh, Chris, question one is uh, talk about the 48-hour water fast. How, off, how frequently should we have it? And question two, uh, are they, uh, Su Suzanne's question, if you have cancer, are they beneficial? I don't know if you uh -oh, Chris can't. Chris, is, I think it sounds like we lost. Maybe we go to Sorop for those while waiting for Chris. Well, I don't know if it's Sorop. Oh, oh, is Chris back? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, just the, the video froze. It's a good picture, though. You're good. Okay. Chris, did you, did you, hear, uh, did you hear my uh, questions, the two questions on the how frequently should we have a 48-hour water fast? And uh, does a 48-hour water fast help with people that already have cancer? Uh -oh. Okay, looks like we lost him off on Zo uh, his uh, Chris's Zoom just dropped off. It's the Russians, Darius, they're doing it, it again. The Russians, <laughs> the, the Russians are attacking. Okay, let's see if we can. If uh, while we're getting uh, Chris's Zoom issues fixed, can we bring Sorab on, Dr. Sorabi? Okay, Dr. Sorabi is coming on momentarily. Uh, No, that's his recommendation. Let's see if we can get Sorab on. There we go. Sorab okay, is on, right. but we can't. Uh, Sorab, can you hear us? Uh, I can hear you. There we yeah. go. Oh, there we go. Cool. Uh, Welcome back. Okay. While we're waiting uh, to get Chris back, you had uh, talked about five things to boost your immune system, and I know you're not an oncologist. You're ear, ear nose, and throat uh, specialist. Uh, you talked about exercise, sleep, sunlight. Well, I don't know what you think your nose throat specialist does, but a lot of what I do is head and neck cancer. So okay. I have, you know, if you want, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Uh, yep. So what happens essentially is this. Imagine, a, um, imagine you have, uh, let's say, a piece of wood, and you have one area that is rotted, and it's weakening the wood, and the wood is going to break. Uh, so if it's small enough and if it's isolated, you can cut that out. And if you can cut it out without breaking the wood, then you try to do that to kind of isolate the disease. And that's kind of what I do. But sometimes you have multiple patches in different spots where cutting it out is not the right thing, where it's going to break the wood. So in a situation like that, you can try treating it with, you know, chemotherapy, radiation and things like that. Uh, 
So I think part of the problem with the question you're asking Dr. Perkins is this, is that Dr. Perkins is saying, look, we can try treating this disease with this medicine, but the problem is, is a bigger problem. It's a systemic problem in the way that human beings <clears throat> conduct themselves in this country. I think one problem with the way you're asking is you're asking it the same way that somebody would ask, well, how do I take this drug to treat this problem? You're saying how many times a day should I, or how many times a year should I do a 48 hour fast to cure my cancer? You, you, you see what I'm saying? Or, or to prevent it, yeah. Right, I know, but you're, it's the same way as saying that you should take this pill twice a day to lower your cholesterol. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? And that's not the way that this, that this stuff is gonna work in, in terms of cancer. Uh, a, li a little bit of something what Dr. Perkins is saying, I, I'm, I don't wanna put words in his mouth, but I think it's a little bit like this. Uh, for example, I think one of the problems is that uh, we treat eating nutrition and things like that different than what it like physically is. If you want some actual mechanisms of action, you can look at the fact that you know, cancer cells metabolize glucose very easily and not because they've lost a lot of their other functions, they can't metabolize some of the other things. Okay, fine. You can look at some of the functions such as when you eat a lot, your constant high levels of sugar, essentially blood sugar, decrease uh, immune cell activity, white cell activity, particularly natural killer cell activity, which seem to be specializing in hunting little cancer cells down. Um, you, you can look at it in mechanisms of action uh, like this. Let me find a path from A to B. But I think a bigger problem is the fact that as a society, as just you know, people in America, we kind of treat food and our diet as a as kind of like entertainment. Uh, mm. you know, the for the same way that you have people addicted to scrolling a screen to, you know, watching uh, stuff on TV. For the same reason, you have people addicted to sugar. You know, how many times it's been like, okay, well, I've been really good. Let me get my little sugar, you know, treat or, or, or whatever it is. Um, and then we start that off with the kids and it continues into school and it continues into adulthood and so forth. So I think a little bit, our issue is a little bit more systemic. So, and, and I've said this before that yes, physiologically, we will find ways that fasting is going to improve disease. And partially it's this, it's that metabolizing that just historically as, as creatures, as living things, taking in food and extracting energy out of that has been so important and such a big deal of our evolution has been put into that, that whenever we have food, our physiology kind of stops everything else and works on getting that food out uh, or the, the energy out of that food. So if that means suppressing immune function, then that's what that means. If it means accumulating proteins that your body should really be getting rid of, then, then that's what it'll do. So as long as you continue, let's say you keep bringing in toys for the kids, you bring in new toys and new toys and new toys, and you never give an, a, a cleanup time, soon enough your house is gonna be overrun with toys and some something is going to fall apart and you can't find your keys, et cetera, et cetera. Problems will, will start arising. I think the real key to fasting and controlling diet, not eating, you know, there, there have been a lot of studies that show a lot of this processed food, the effect it has on your body physiologically is not very much different than drugs. So if on the one hand you think that, you know, drug trafficking is very extreme of that, if you think that should be uh, controlled, then, you know, some of the things that FDA approves to put into food don't make a lot of sense, you know, medically, physiologically. So yeah, those things should not be put in, uh, into food. Um, uh, so, but the big thing about fasting, I think is if it, it gives you a chance to control your body and those desires and things that, that make you work, as opposed to letting those desires effectively uh, run your life. Now, and yes, go ahead, a, Mike. Argument, Mike has a I question. You, we will find the physiological, yep. you know, support for that. So, so I'm going to share, we, share with you, Darius. And, and then I want to, because Chris is back, I want to yeah. get uh, to Suzanne's question. But right, I'm going to share with you real quick. So I started intermittent fasting on April 18th. Okay. And I had a big problem with my circadian rhythm for years, sleep apnea, waking up just whenever. And I have never been more regular after about 
two, three weeks on that. Now it's been two months. Okay. I wake up with the sun coming up. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. This problem I've had for years, intermittent fasting, it's really regulating caloric intake and not yeah. eating as much crap. Like Robert Morton said, That's right. sugar's hard to kick. But I want to ask Dr. Sarabi a quick question. I would love to know in your practice as an ENT physician, what are some of the kind of cancers as a patient uh, you know, or I may encounter with my ENT? What are some of the ones you're dealing with with head and neck? And then just quickly, uh, so Rob, because then we're going to go to uh, Chris on answering some of the previous questions. Right. So the main type of head and neck cancer is something called squamous cell carcinoma. There's a couple different broad groups of cancer. Cancers that come from the lining of stuff called carcinomas, which even the lining of your skin, if you flip that, the lining of the inside of your mouth, of your throat, of your swallowing tube, of the inside of your inner tubes, all the way to all the, where the food comes out of you, all of that is just, it's something called lining. You can think of it as, um, you know, as one group of cancers that come off the lining. Um, so we deal mostly with that. However, there are other cancers um, in the head and neck because it's area rich in essentially all the different type of uh, tissues. There are nerve tumors, uh, some pretty um, which aggressively show up a lot of times in the back of the nose at the roof of, of the skull. There are, uh, there are a lot of uh, benign tumors. Uh, there are various skin cancers, some of them which are not really skin cancers like um, melanomas and Merkel cells and so forth uh, that are actually nerve uh, uh, tumors as well. And there's uh, within the kind of tumors that line the, the inside and outside of our body, uh, specifically in the back of the throat, we have you know, mounting evidence is essentially the cat's out of the bag, that a lot of it can be uh, these days induced by uh, the HPV virus, uh, as well as other viruses. There are EBV viruses that can also induce these things. But uh, especially in the back of the tongue, the throat, the tonsil area, uh, there are these virally induced things so, that we generally don't treat with surgery. Then, uh, so how, uh, just real, maybe in 20 seconds or less, is there something you recommend to the audience on, uh, it sounds like once you have that, you're going to go through, you know, chemotherapy. Right. Is there, what would you recommend on how to prevent getting there? Is there anything you would say, okay, you know, if you had, you know, we talked about, uh, Dr. Perkins talked about obesity and fasting. Any uh, tips you have as an ENT doctor and surgeon for our audience on, okay, here, some of it is genetic. We can't control some of this your environment. Uh, anything else you recommend, anything you recommend to the audience on here's a lifestyle that could reduce your risk of cancer? Well, yeah, and it's not too different than, than the five things I told you before. Number one, the food, stop eating so much food. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll focus on sugar, but it's not, and maybe on a different show, we, we can talk about this, but stop eating so much food, give your body a chance to put everything away, to clean everything up. So it's, and it's, it, it is the reason we talk about fasting and not just, you know, eating one spoon every hour. It's not that it's giving your body a long time without a, a, any, you know, sort of uh, caloric input, um, exercise, which was another one of those, uh, those pillars, um, you know, we talked about at the time I was talking about uh, an acetylcysteine, but there's a slew of of these things, which if you're having a good diet, you don't need these as supplements. However, you could make a, a list of supplements if you're not able to, to get that, you know, uh, uh, through, through the diet and then sleep. I think those are I will say those will be the same ones that'll help. I think we'll find that those same things are the things that are going to help uh, prevent cancer. And the reason for that is that those things disrupt your body's natural balance and the way that, that it's supposed to be. The more you inhibit that, the more you allow something like cancer to, to get out of hand. I think, you know, uh, I think we'll find the exact mechanisms of action as, as time goes on. But get, get enough sleep, stop eating so much food, exercise, and you know, eat the right foods. We say supplements, but I don't want to get into into that right now. And and I do when I uh, when I see patients, one of my things afterwards, they say, "Okay, well, we're going to see the radiation doctor. We're going to see a thing. We're going to go through the surgery. Is there anything else I can do?" I tell them straight up. I say, "Yeah, stop eating sugar. You know, it's not going to hurt you. You know, and it may help you a lot. So just you know, I tell them that right away. I don't I don't feel bad doing it because I don't feel it has any negative effect on them. It's only going to have a positive effect on them." And then also get sunlight 
and uh, the NAC supplement that you talked about. Right. NAC, and again, NAC is something that you're, if you're eating the right kinds of food, as well as a lot of these, um, these uh, things that you, were, uh, that you were mentioning earlier, um, uh, the polyphenols, the cancer-fighting stuff in uh, turmeric, if you're having a, a good diet, a lot of these things will come. But yes, if you just can't get that together, we can give you a list of supplements, which will be a lot more expensive than buying, you know, eating it off, off the food. Uh, but yes, there, there are supplementation that, that we can go along. But it's number five. It's not, num you know, number one is probably the food thing. Number two is exercise. Number three is sleep, you know. Okay, great. Let's bring uh, Dr. Perkins back. If he's, is, Yes, he is back with us. Uh, Suzanne uh, Crosina Samp question. 48-hour fast, are they beneficial if you already have cancel, cancer uh, or is that just a preventative thing that you recommend? Yeah, <clears throat> well, there was, when I did the deep dive into the data of cancer prevention and treatment of cancer when you're on, uh, with fasting, when you, when, once you've developed cancer, there was a very small group of breast cancer patients that they had two groups that they had fasting before the chemotherapy. And what they noticed is that fasting before chemotherapy improved the white blood cell count, because as you know, chemotherapy drops white blood cell counts, and we have to give drugs to raise the white cell count, but fasting causes white blood cell count elevation. It also was protective of normal tissue, uh, because as I told you, chemotherapy goes after normal tissue as well as cancer cells. And so it was protective of normal tissue. So, um, you know, those are the two areas, I mean, that has some science to it. Because as, as Doris, as you've brought up before in a conversation that we've had before, there's a lot of hearsay out there. You know, a perfect example is vitamin C. Linus Pauling won the Nobel Prize for vitamin C. It'd be, you know, they put in everything. You want to prevent a cold, take vitamin C. You get cancer, there's a physician in town that charges $500 for 50 cents of vitamin C to infuse in a patient. After he died, they found that all of his data was fabricated. So oh, wow. here you have this vitamin C, vitamin C, and it goes on for decades with no proven scientific benefit. So you know, there have been plenty of times in science that we've thought, well, this is a great idea. And then we do a randomized trial to look at that in a scientific way, the way Socrates wanted us to look at medicine and find that, wow, that wasn't such a great idea after all. And so, you know, I, th I, I agree. I think in America, we are, are a country of excess. We think if this much is good, this much is better. And that's not necessarily true. I think, you know, I agree. Well-balanced diet, you know, weight loss, exercise, sleep. Um, and I agree. If you eat a well-balanced diet, you don't need a bunch of nutritional supplements. You know, for example, with broccoli and... <clears throat> Um, and bok choy and all in that category of foods. Unfortunately, the way Americans cook food is they boil the hell out of it. You know, that that's how you make a vegetable holy. You boil the hell out of it. That was a bad joke. Um, but, you know, they boil it. And that gets rid of all nutritional value. You have to steam it or eat it raw. Well, who's going to eat broccoli raw? One of my grandkids does. But, you know, it's unusual to eat raw broccoli. And so, you know, you can go down this pathway, oh, well, I'm going to eat broccoli, I'm going to eat bok choy and, and get all these anti-cancer drugs in my system, but it has to be done right. And, you know, and, and you know, getting back to the weight loss thing, I think, you know, I could cure 30% of all breasts, I could cure 30% of all cancers in the United States. Takes one thing, shut your mouth. That's all it takes. And that is a thing about Americans because, you know, Americans, we are a very self-centered society. I mean, sure, we give a lot to nonprofits and we help out in our neighborhoods a little bit. But in general, it's a narcissistic society. So people that are obese, they don't care if it's going to cost Medicare 
hundreds of thousands of dollars when they get older to replace their hips or take care of their diabetes. They don't care. Why should I care? Somebody else will pay for it. Hey, Dr. Perkins, can I interject just one second? I want to bring this full circle to the beginning when you ask, well, what is cancer? Uh, this last thing you said, I think, completes that circle. I've always thought of cancer as a cell that is ultra-narcissistic in the way you're describing. It's a cell that doesn't realize that it's inside a body. It thinks it's just himself and whatever he can do. I'm just going to get more for myself and more for myself. And it overtakes, you know, it takes the food from the other cells and it grows into their space and it spreads out everywhere. So it's a cell that thinks the most important thing to do is just to, you know, get me, me, me. Exactly. Me, me, me. It doesn't realize that it only, it's only me when it lives inside a harmonious body. And in being me, 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 it ends up destroying the host and therefore it, itself. So I think it's, it's a bit of a metaphor, but I, that's just how I see things, uh, as, you know, metaphorically. And I think that both the things you said kind of close that circle. Well, and in expanding on that, me, me, me in society doesn't allow us to behave as we all should and care for our the community. The com we should want to do everything in our power and teach our kids to do everything in their power to make this world a better place. And that starts at home. That starts not just with diet, but philosophy about taking care of yourself, taking care of our common man. I mean, I'm going off on a tangent right now, but we California is the fourth richest economy in the world and we have homelessness. I, I don't connect those dots other than the fact that we're a narcissistic society and we really don't care about our common man. We don't even care about our own health because we'll become obese and we'll let our kids become obese and shorten their lifespan. Would you do that? You're a dad of three. Would you do something to your kids that would shorten their lifespan? But that's what the population is doing now. They're doing things in their own lives. You know, as I've often said, kids don't do what we tell them to do. Kids do as they see us do. So if we're hedonist, hedonistic pigs and go to McDonald's and supersize, they're going to do that too. So why would you subject your child to a shortened lifespan, potential of diabetes, cancer, heart disease, just, I, I don't understand that. Do you Chris, love your child? Chris, question for you and Dr. Sarabi. Uh, comment, uh, Robert Wharton put a comment. I think it's hard for most people to afford good food. Is that true? I just, I, I told, you know, this whole baloney that higher educated people have less obesity. You know, I think just, and I'm gonna put my foot in my mouth probably, higher educated people have more self-control because that's how they got through school. That's how they got through high school and got good grades to get into college. That's how they got through college. They had discipline. I don't, I, you know, and you can look all through the internet and, and you know, the risk of, di of, uh, of obesity is half in an educated population that it is in say uh, Hispanic or African American. And I agree that a lot of that is, there's a couple aspects there. One is cultural. You know, because the African-American diet is not very healthy. The Latin diet is also not very healthy. But at the same time, you have to be motivated. So just because you say, oh, rich people don't get fat. Well, it's not that. Or educated people don't get fat. I just think there's a motivation factor there. I wanna there's a lack of motivation to, you yeah. know, if you take your clothes off and look at yourself in the mirror and you weigh 200 pounds, come on. So you I have wanna, to be motivated to fix that. I'm going to push back a little bit against that. Not necessarily your observation about self-control. I think that's very important. That makes a difference. But I think what Robert Wharton was talking about there is, you know, cheaper materials are cheaper to produce and offer cheaper prices to consumers. And sometimes you have people that say, well, that's cheaper. I'm going to buy that brand. But it has high fructose corn syrup rather than real sugar. And there are so many substitutes that have been introduced to consumers. It goes back to the argument again. What is the balance between liberty and being able to make our own choices versus the government USDA coming in and saying, hey, palm oil is crap for you. High corn syrup is bad for you. We're not. We're going to reg regulate it. Dr. Sarabi, I know you're ready to go on that one. Well, let me just jump into that real quick. Firstly, we shouldn't allow the government to dictate what we put in our mouth. That's communism. 
I mean, Stalin did that. We don't, or prior to Stalin, that's communism. We so don't need the government. If a tobacco so company to puts cyanide in cigarettes, that's okay. We should just do nothing about that. I'm sorry, to do what? If a tobacco company puts an additive like cyanide in cigarettes, we should just not do anything about that. There's no line at all. Because I, I, I agree with you. I don't like government overreaching. But is there a line whatsoever? Well, at, the whole tobacco the thing is a big discussion that you could open up a huge Pandora's box. But I don't think the government should mandate it. Because then what happens is that society gets soft. All of a sudden, there's no free choice any longer because the government's telling you what to do. I and agree. It's your I, own responsibility I, because you want your kids to live a long, healthy life that you're not going to be no. overweight. No, or have this is, this is fascinating. But when we're dealing with record inflation right now and people are on fixed incomes and they're not necessarily using EBT money, but they're trying to purchase... They have so many options. And unfortunately, Inga asked the question, do we teach our people to read the labels and know what they mean? They may be making decisions as consumers because they feel like they don't have a choice and they're buying bad food because they're, those companies undercut quality producers. I want to talk about this issue actually for a minute. It's about, uh, Chris brought it up, Dr. Perkins. Mike, you've talked about it. There's been several comments on it as well. It comes down to educating our sure. kids, our families at a young age, at schools. Uh, unfortunately, medical schools uh, teach, what is it, eight hours in a four-year uh, curriculum uh, program uh, on nutrition, where uh, DOs, doctor of osteopathic medicines, have uh, eight, to t eight to 12 hours of nutrition every semester. And so many folks don't know, okay, I have, you know, I, I got EBT, you know, I want to just go to buy big Coke, uh, regular Coke, and, you know, uh, uh, other high-caloric uh, food items. Uh, we, 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 we need education at an early, early stage. So, you know, I have a limited dollar amount. What should I be purchasing? Do I buy a rotisserie chicken or do I buy a few hot dogs? Uh, do I buy uh, donuts or, or do I buy... Uh, some some broccoli and and and, and lemon uh, uh, fresh lemons and olive oil and I, well, I can make an, a great salad myself. Uh, what well, what are your thoughts, both of you, on on edu on educating at an early age, and really educating our parents early on? Well, I can only give you one little caveat to that. You know, in my practice, I, since I was you know women's cancer specialist, I saw only women, and a lot of them were teachers. Well, when the Obamas were in the White House, Michelle Obama had a great idea to only allow kids to eat healthy foods in school. Uh, and my teachers would tell me it was a flop because 90% of that healthy food ended up in the garbage and the kids would go down the street to the local McDonald's and have food. So, you know, it does start at the home. I totally agree with that. But if you look at the data right now in the United States, the amount of people that are eating out versus eating at home. I mean, when is it that you drive by a fast food place and the line isn't around the block a few times? Uh, and when you go to eat, out to eat, they, they serve you enough for three people. And so, you know, I agree with you that there is a cost factor. But I think if you are you look at the health of what you purchase, you could eat cheaper at home with healthy food than going to a restaurant or McDonald's totally. or Taco mm -hmm. Bell. Okay. And so it, totally. it is part of the educational process. But again, it gets back to what I just said earlier. It's about passion. It's about passion to make the world a better place. It's about passion about taking better care of yourself. It's passion leaving a legacy to your child that it's not he's he or she's not going to die of diabetes or cancer okay. because you decided to supersize every time you went to McDonald's. Uh, we are almost out of time, um, and I'm going to ask, Cam Malloy had a question. So if cancer has returned, should someone fast? And what are the best approaches? So that is a kind of a difficult question because usually when cancer reoccurs, it depends on the type of cancer. There was people are going to get chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, unfortunately, causes uh, nausea, vomiting. And so a lot of the times with patients with advanced cancer, we're talking to them about increasing their caloric intake because 
we want them to have a better, better stamina by eating more calories. There's not a lot of data, unfortunately, about the effectiveness of chemotherapy, uh, the effectiveness of fasting in cancer. Um, there are small studies, and the reason why, and I hate to be a, a naysayer to capitalism, but there isn't going to be a very few randomized, <clears throat> decent trials looking at caloric restriction in patients going through chemotherapy because there's no money to be made up in answering that question. And I hate to say that, but, you know, it's, you know, the world of capitalism in the United States or in the drug company sphere. Great point. Let's put up slide 31. What about cannabis? Uh, we hear that cannabis is good for cancer uh, patients. Uh, what are your thoughts on that uh, for both of you? So, Start with Dr. I'll give you my blunt uh, opinion about marijuana. I think marijuana was legalized for two reasons, uh, to dumb down the population and create a tax base for the politicians. Okay. So it was a win-win for politicians. You know, they have a dumb electorate and they get tax bases out of it. <laughs> I can tell you, Dr. Perkins, it's not a big tax base for Fresno. I'll tell you that okay, right now. It isn't for Fresno yet, but for places and like it's not Oregon. Be. But, but, okay, Colorado. but t tell us about cannabis and, and cancer. Okay, so in the old days, like 30 years ago, uh, when we would treat young men with testicular cancer, you'd walk on the floor, the oncology floor at St. Agnes, and it smelled like a party because they were all smoking marijuana to reduce nausea. If there's one area that it works in is reduction of chemotherapy-induced nausea. There is no data because, again, there's no randomized trials. You can make the hypothesis all day long that it does and this and does that. But until there's sound data, nobody can tell you that marijuana has any beneficial effectiveness directly to, to either prevention or treatment of cancer. Let's get so Rob on. Any comments? Uh, from uh, Dr. Sarabi. Well, yeah, to the previous question, number one, it is not more expensive to only eat one time a day as opposed to eat three times a day. It costs less money. Second of all, Dr. Parkins is correct. If you buy a chicken and cook it, it will cost you less than if you go get, you know, a, a third of a chicken from some, uh, you know, from an uh, outdoor, you know, place. And then some of these vegetables you know, especially the cruciferate vegetables, they're super cheap. I mean, cauliflower has really come up these days, but cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, you know, uh, not super duper popular and, you know, high end asparagus, you know, these things uh, where you can, you know, the, all this, instead of, you can cut a lot of other costs by eating these things well. I mean, you're, it, when you look at just the grocery bill, your grocery bill might be higher but you have more energy during the day. You, you're not as sick. You're not taking as many medicines. You're not taking as many uh, supplements. You know, so the, the benefit is beyond just the simple grocery bill. But again, the thing that I'm saying is just don't eat so much. I'm not saying get the most organic, uh, you know, thoroughbred, only grass-fed, grass-finished beef in the world. I'm just saying don't eat so much. You know, eat once a day you eat, okay, that, that's okay. Just don't eat so much. There's, that doesn't, that's no increase in, in cost. Okay. Uh, and then last, and then that gentleman who went and bought the Coke with the $5 that he had, it's not because he didn't have education. He knows that Coke's not good for him. You think he doesn't know? That's a little bit insulting. You know what I'm saying? He knows that's not good for him. The, uh, but, but he's doing it not because, because again, that food that he's eating is, he's not seeing it as nutrition for his body. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure, it, it, it's a drug, it's a Netflix cliffhanger that he's got to see the next episode of. You, you know what I'm saying? That's what he's getting that soda for. It's <clears throat> not because he's thirsty. It's not because he needs c calories to you know, run his mitochondria. Um, so I think that you can educate them. That's good. And we should educate them, educate them in the home. But don't think it's going to solve that, you know, th that, that problem there. I agree. Uh, I'm sorry, one more question before I get to Mike. Uh, Camilo had another question. It's stage four, and they're not taking chemo. They're taking estrogen blockers and Kiskali and doing everything right, not obese. Do they do fasting so, or no? Well, I think 
You know, one of the measurements that they are looking at in breast cancer and the cause of uterine cancer in particular is high estrogen levels. So anything that you can do to reduce your estrogen levels, such as reducing weight, has a benefit. Well, how about plant-based diets uh, and, and not eating red meat? Any comments from you guys, from both of you, on plant-based diet? Well, I think there's two aspects there with plant-based. Number one, your caloric intake is going to more than likely, depending on how you cook it, will be less. So in that in itself, you're going to you know, be somewhat of the caloric restriction fasting. Secondly, um, you know, when we counsel breast cancer patients on low fat diets, you know, meat has high fat. And so, you know, there has been plenty of data looking at uh, colon cancer causation, for example, you know, colon cancer is a much higher incidence here in the United States than it does in Africa. Well, Africa, they don't eat very much meat. And so, again, you know, there's data out there. None of it is like, oh, my God, this is just fantastic uh, data. But there's enough there to say, again, balance is everything. A little meat, a little fish, a little chicken, a little vegetables, not a lot of McDonald's and Taco Bell. So it's just, again, control, self-control of what you put in your mouth. Another you question everything. came in. What about um, plant-based diet uh, that have, um, that stimulate estrogen like lavender? I'm sorry, plants that stimulate estrogen such as lavender or uh, to, to use it topically or in, uh, ingesting it? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you, so if you look to the breast cancer data and you look at birth control, because that has been looked at, that has been looked at multiple times, birth control pills have estrogen in them. It's not, and then the PremPro uh, debacle, because PremPro is a combination of estrogen and progesterone, found that it wasn't the estrogen that caused the cancer, it was more the progesterone. And so, you know, oral pills are, I mean, Medicaid, you know, say phytoestrogens, you know, um, estrogen that is in plant-based food, most of that is probably not to a level that we need to worry about. You know, in patients who had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer in reference to this last question that you had, you know, patients would say, well, you know, I like soy. Well, you know, you'd have to drink 50, 50 gallons of soy to get enough estrogen in your body to worry about it. Again, it's getting back to that modulation of what you eat. Not a lot of anything is good. And the same thing with treatment. Not a lot of every anything is going to be beneficial. It's just a well-balanced diet, well-balanced lifestyle. You don't smoke. You don't drink ex excessively. You exercise. You get good sleep. That's all you need to do. How about red and, wine? Is red wine good uh, for heart or cancer, pre cancer prevention or just a healthy diet? And that's a critical question because if you say yes, we're going to have red wine next week on this show in these cups, these great GV wire mugs. Well, so. Only if it comes from Fresno State. <laughs> I like, Dr. Perkins, I like you. I like that answer. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You want to answer that? Dr. Well, Strong? in the same, uh, so let me say it like this. And you want to drink some red wine, do it. But the alcohol in there has no no real benefit. In fact, they've shown that anything, you know, more than this much alcohol is, is deleterious, even if it's once in a while. Secondly, the thing that is in there, which is studied pretty thoroughly by a guy you'll find all, all over the place named uh, uh, Sinclair, David Sinclair, uh, which it's a group of molecules, but the most famous of them uh, is resveratrol. And it does appear in wine, but in the same way that you got to drink 50 gallons of, uh, you know, soy milk to get the estrogen effect, you got to drink 50 gallons of red wine to accumulate enough uh, resveratrol to, uh, you know, so, to affect. No, no, so I, I got the order, 50 gallons. No, I'm yeah, teasing. Exactly. I'm yeah. teasing. If you want to drink some red wine because it helps you deal with the stresses of your life and be a better human being, then do it. But mm. don't think that. How about grape, so grape seed extract? Is that no uh, data? 
What is that? Show me the data. Show me the science. Or show me the money. Yeah. Uh, so well, how, that's just it. That's the, the yeah, money exactly. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're we're way. It's good for a lubrication. I'm just telling you. Like <laughs> even like mechanical. That's what it used to be. Used really? For. Okay. Massages. Uh, and we're like actually way over over our, our a lot of time. About 15 minutes over. <clears throat> I'm going to ask uh, for uh, closing comments. I'm, I'm going to actually ask a, a question that may be semi-controversial. How about sex in cancer prevention? <laughs> Darius, uh, again, show me the data. <laughs> but I think you've got to be careful with that one. So, <laughs> so, so <laughs> is going to have a different answer. answer. This is... But I'll tell you, there is evidence of sex in, in uh, cancer, but well, it's, not, head neck. it's not against it. It's pro it in the sense that what do ladies get, you know, pap smears for, mm. uh, which is, you know, we think of uh, the HPV that induces the, the chronic changes in that cell, which have a stepwise function towards cancer. And that's what I was pointing at earlier in head and neck cancer, which uh, the thought is, is that these days, oropharyngeal cancer, meaning not the front of your mouth, but kind of the back of your throat, uh, the most, you know, the greatest increase in those cancers is not from smoking and drinking, but it's from HPV related oh. uh, uh, induction of, of um, How about oxytocin? Yeah, cell growth. So therefore, Oxy in that cell, in, in that sense, it can be interesting. That's interesting. sexually transmitted disease in, in some ways. Right. How about oxytocin? Is that help with uh, cancer prevention? Mm. No. I don't know. Don't know. Probably okay. All right. You, Dr. Sharabi, last thing. Do you recommend then like the HPV vaccine for younger people? Is, has, is there enough data to show that does actually reduce certain strains of it and will hopefully reduce some of those cancers or is that still controversial? So actually the, there is two strains that they hit, which are some of the more aggressive ones, although there's more, but the main ones being, you know, the 16 and 18 variants that, uh, that is what they, but, but here's the thing. I don't know when we started treating kids with that, those guys are not old enough Too early. to, to, to yes. tell you, you know what I'm yeah. saying? <clears throat> um, so I, I'm, I'm just not going to weigh in on that. Cause I don't, I don't know. My, my gut feeling is. I don't think, it, if not that varieties, there's 34, there's 35, there's 38. There's there's other varieties that we may be selecting for those guys by just vaccinating again these two. So I have reservations about it. But theoretically, yeah, it'll help prevent uh, cervical and uh, oropharyngeal cancer. Although we may end up causing a, a problem that, that we don't know of. Okay. Very good. Let's get the uh, closing comments. One minute or less. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Perkins, uh, Dr. Sorabi, and then we'll wrap up. Any last messages for our audience? What to do, what not to do? Uh, I think if, if I had one wish, I mean, more than one, my one wish would be the health of my family. Uh, <laughs> if I had a second wish, it would be to instill in the American population self-control that's it i mean as i said i can cure 30 we have a drug that cures 30 percent of all cancers and that's self-control so that's and we have to get off this high horse of me 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 and you know social social networking and it's all about me because how you take care of yourself your kids are going to learn that. Society is going to learn that. And I think society in general needs to become more self-conscious, less narcissistic, <clears throat> and to take care of their community. This is our community, especially Fresno, such a phenomenal community that as individuals, can you imagine if every individual tried to do something to make the world a better place in Fresno, Fresno would even be more of a rock star than it already is. So my closing comment is self-control. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. Discipline and self-control to make the world a better place in your own world. And be careful with your children. I mean, the children are the future of this country. And what we teach them now, they're going to carry into the subsequent generations. So, you know, do you want your kid to live less time 
Well, then keep telling them that you're going to go to McDonald's. That's got to stop. So that would be my one wish, that the U.S. population would develop some self-control and understand what's important in society. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so, Rob? I mean, exactly the same. And the way that you, so how do you teach self-control and things like that? I think that's some of the things we've been talking about. Why is it that as far back as goes and far reaches of the earth, everybody tells you, hey, you got to fast. You just got to not eat sometimes. And we're all going to do it together. We're all going to practice not eating together. We're going to control ourselves together and we're going to help each other through this during this month, during this day, during this whatever. Uh, and that's how you teach self-control and, you know, discipline and so forth. Uh, rather than looking at it as a drug, oh, I got cancer. Let me fast for 48 hours twice a month. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to work that way. Uh, it's, uh, you know, um, exactly a society that has self-control. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Sure. <clears throat> so, you know, one thing we didn't get to talk about, and this was a very fascinating show, and I, I even learned a, a little bit. I always learn, learn more with our healthcare shows, um, is that we didn't talk about what the actual role of government is in this process. On the one hand, we can claim that too much intervention is communist, that we have individual liberties, and I'm a firm believer in individual liberties and choice that we get to, that we get to make. But on the other hand, there is a point that when you make bad decisions, ultimately it accumulates into decisions that cost taxpayers money because Medicare uh, costs get passed on to, to someone else, uh, like the working class, like you and me. Um, so I'm really concerned about those kind of things. I'd love if we had a show talking about that. But I also think that when someone consumes, I mean, this is actually a healthy drink. This is sparkling water. If this was a soda, I understand we're educated to believe this is full of sugar, even diet soda. It's unhealthy for you. But I don't quite think that people understand, especially at a younger age, the consequences of this decision 40, 50 years down the line, or maybe even sooner than that. Same issue goes for, high, for racing, which we had during the pandemic. People were racing their cars. You have to take a test <clears throat> so you know what the law is, at least to a certain degree, when you get your license. But you're still at a younger age, more likely, and male, more likely to drive fast and not only kill yourself, but kill someone else. So we've come in and say, hey, it is highly illegal for you to race, and we're not only going to... Uh, give you a ticket, we're going to take away your car. We're taking away your property as a consequence for 30 days. That's what we do in Fresno. Does that equate to certain healthcare decisions people make if yeah. it impacts other people? I don't know, but I'd love to have a debate on that and talk more about what we can do in the future on that. Thank you, Mike. And my closing comments is uh, fasting. Um, there's a reason why all the major religions of the world, really God's recommendation for us is to fast. Uh, Judaism has it, Christianity has it, and, and Islam, my religion, kind of refined it into a 30-day fast. And it's more than just about not eating or drinking uh, during the day. It's about uh, re uh, re resisting the temptation uh, to eat or drink or smoke uh, when there is plenty of food, uh, food uh, available to you. Um, fasting does a lot of beautiful things for, for the body, gives so many of our organs a break during the day. Um, and also gives, brings mental clarity. Uh, I religiously, well, I fast, regularly fast, uh, uh, do, and observe Ramadan uh, for 30 days uh, every year. And, um, and ever since I've talked to Chris Perkins, uh, maybe over a decade ago, I do intermittent fasting on, on a regular basis. You know, if nothing else, to give my pancreas and my digestive system a break um, uh, during the day. So uh, with that, a lot of great information uh, today. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. Uh, thank, one, thank you. one last interjection really quick. Please. The reason why these religious organizations fast is because it motivates us to become closer to our religious base. It focuses again okay. our <clears throat> intent. And that's what's lacking in the United States, a focused intent to make you make the world better and make yourself better. And, and Chris, we're going to have you back on not, uh, very soon, not necessarily to talk about oncology and cancer, but I know you have very strong views on politics, government, uh, what government's role should be in our lives and who should be running our, our, running our country. So you're going to be back soon to, to discuss that uh, Unless if you want to give a brief 20-second 
a preview on, on that. Uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, f fasting. Let, let me just let me just end with that. Uh, Strongly believe in, in fasting. Uh, there's a, one, a lot of wonderful things for the brain, the soul, and connection with our Lord, uh, and of course, our body. Thank you, Dr. Exactly. Sarabi. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. Mike, thank you. Uh, thanks to all of our viewers. Uh, fascinating show. Hope to see all of you again uh, next Tuesday evening. And remember, this uh, podcast will be uh, aired in its entirety and broken up into segments uh, starting tomorrow afternoon. Great evening, everybody. Dr. Strabi, it's good seeing you. Hey, you as well. I'm sorry.